Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of Department of Pediatric Orthopedics, KGMU, we welcome everyone for today's webinar. This is sixth webinar uh, in the uh, uh, lecture series of pediatric trauma uh, on the uh, on the uh, Friday musings uh, uh, series of uh, UPOA and KGMU. And I welcome all the learned speakers and thank them for their effort and time for this webinar. And I welcome all the attendees. Also, it is our uh, uh, fortune, we are fortunate that uh, President UPOA, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dhawan is uh, with us. And uh, I request her to say a few words for this today's webinar. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Suresh. A very good evening to one and all present here. And I welcome you all to this Friday series of webinar on pediatric orthopedics organized by KGMU Dep Department of uh, Pediatric Orthopedics headed by Dr. Ajay Singh. And I congratulate him and his team for continuously coming up with this pediatric trauma series, which I'm sure that is everyone who's attending it is getting benefited. And I also thank the faculties present here today, Dr. Arun Gupta, Dr. Abhishek, and Dr. Raji Raman, our good friend, spending time and enlightening us with their wisdom. So I, without wasting much of your time, I would like to move on to the academics. Over to Suresh. Thank you. And welcome again. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, now I request uh, uh, Professor Ajay Singh, sir, Head Department of Pediatric Orthopedics, KGMU, and uh, President, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of Uttar Pradesh, to formally welcome all the speakers and attendees and start the session. Over uh, to you, Ajay Singh, sir. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Uh, on the behalf of Uttar Pradesh uh, Orthopedic Association uh, and the presence of our President, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dhawan, and from the, my team from uh, Department of Pediatric Orthopedic KGMU, I welcome once again uh, to all the delegates and and my esteemed uh, esteem speakers as well as uh, the Artho uh, TV uh, team uh, uh, who are, uh, everyone is there uh, just to improve the sensitization of uh, injuries uh, by a series of webinar uh, which we are conducting every month. And uh, the purpose of uh, this uh, series is to uh, gain the interest in uh, young orthopedic surgeons uh, about uh, this uh, new uh, super specialty. Uh, um, I would like to share that uh, uh, the Pediatric Orthopedic uh, Society of uh, UP, that is possible, has just in, uh, started its membership drive and within 48 hours, uh, we are able to uh, make uh, 62 life members and uh, 23 associate members in just the span of 48 hours. So it is. Uh, this shows how much uh, interest is there in the in our uh, friends, uh, young, uh, especially the young orthopedic surgeons. So uh, I wish everyone a very uh, nice uh, session on uh, pediatric sports injury. Over to uh, Social Raj. Thank you so much, sir. As I noticed, Dr. Anup has joined. Good evening, sir. A few words from your side, sir. Uh, good evening, Suresh. Uh, Thank you for calling me. I uh, welcome all the speakers and congratulate the Department of Pediatric Orthopedics for uh, uh, continuing this webinar. I'm sure and very sure about this, that this will continue further and the members not only across UP, all across India will keep on learning the intricacies of pediatric orthopedics. Thank you, uh, Suresh and uh, Dr. Ajay Singh for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, welcome, you. Anup. Uh, Venkal, uh, Anup, uh, you are here despite of your ill health. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vas. Thank you. Suresh. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much uh, for all the uh, kind words. And I once again welcome all the <coughs> attendees who have joined now. And we are happy to announce that we are live on Zoom as well as uh, YouTube and Ortho TV platform. And uh, these all three uh, will give access to a large audience. And I request to post their question in the chat box uh, or WhatsApp to me at double eight two six five double three eight three four. A Q question and answer session will be taken at the end of session, and all the speakers will 
uh, will be happy to answer at the end of session. And without much ado, I welcome today's uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Abhishek Saini, who is Assistant Professor in Department uh, sports medicine in the King George's Medical University. He has done his uh, FNB in sports injury from the Sports Injury Center, uh, Subdarjing Hospital, New Delhi. And uh, he'll be uh, giving his uh, talk on today's uh, first topic. Over to you. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I screen visible? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, thank you, Ajay, sir, for giving us this platform to discuss the very important topic of today's scenario, which is pediatric sports injuries. The pediatric sports in India is in a very beginning stage compared to our Western counterpart. So it's very important for us to discuss this because a lot of kids nowadays are going into sports. Just hang on. The slide is not moving. Yeah, so uh, you can see a picture on your screen. So this picture sums up literally everything about pediatric sports. I'll discuss about this picture in the end. So the outline of today's talk would be to discuss the risk and benefits of youth sports participation, the epidemiology, the exceptionality of young athlete, to identify different overuse injuries, and the most important of all, the prevention strategy. So... The first of all, a very big question is now a lot of kids are playing at different level. So because of that, they are now more prone to injuries, right? So the question is, should we stop our kids from playing? So I was going through the literature, you know, and I came upon this paper, which was published by American College of Sports Medicine in 2018. So they come up with this uh, pediatric inactivity tried, tried of exercise deficit a physical illiteracy and pediatric dynapnea, which is decrease in the muscle strength. So they found out that almost 60% kids in USA, they were suffering from this triad. So actually, we don't want our kids to be suffering from this. So the benefits of youth sports. So the thing is, it's a fun activity. It helps in developing our self-esteem. It helps kids you know, to socialize with their pair. And then it increases the teamwork and on a longer run, it helps in developing the leadership qualities. But there's a fine line. Now with a lot of competition coming in, uh, there's a lot of pressure from coaches, from teachers, from parents for increased activities at younger age. And this leads to what we'll be knowing about pediatric sport injuries. Now, a lot of uh, studies have been done in the Western world about all the pediatric sport injuries. Uh, we don't have any data from our subcontinent. So all the data which I'll be quoting will be from the Western world. So according uh, to this study in USA, there are almost 60 million kids who are playing organized sports. And of them, more than 44 million are playing more than one sports in a year. And the injuries, they have increased from 10.8% to 12.4% to 2015. All this data is from USA. We don't have any data from Indian subcontinent. And uh, talking about high school athletes, almost 2 million kids are getting injured. Of those, one-fourth of them are visiting the physicians and half of them are having overuse injuries. So according to CDC, more than half of the injuries are preventable. And there are 30,000 hospitalizations and of these, 21 are having traumatic brain injuries. So the reason for more of traumatic brain injuries in those kids are more into rugby, baseball, and basketball. Now, this study in uh, 2014, uh, they've shown that uh, the acute injuries, you know, depends upon which kind of sports you are playing. So, if you're playing a team sport, uh, the incidence of strain and strain is more, whereas if you're playing individual sports, the strain, strain, and fracture is almost equivalent. Statuliani at all have done a lot of research work on pediatric sports injuries. So they have compared about children of the age group of 5 to 12 and adolescents from the age group of 13 to 17. So they found out the younger age group, whereas the older age group had an equivalent proportion of all other injuries. In another paper of theirs, they uh, differentiated between male and female injuries. So the fractures were more common in the male counterpart, whereas the female counterpart had more of patellofemoral pain injuries. Now, why do we need to study uh, young separately? Because they have different body composition, which uh, leads to more injuries. Now, children, they are not miniature adults. 
as we grow the head to body ratio decreases so in the initial 2 to 5 years of age the head to body ratio is more which predisposes the kids to more injuries also they have decrease in neuromuscular control and also the lever arm of the arm and the legs are more which leads to more injuries then they have a growth spurt which between the 12 to 14 years of age makes the kid more prone to growth plate injuries and this is the most neglected part so the kids they have they usually generate more of heat and they dissipate weight less heat and this leads to dehydration and fatigue so this needs to be taken care of now coming to sport injuries you know they can be age specific sport specific they can be acute overuse or site specific so most of the acute injuries are usually traumatic injuries which have been dealt in the previous we won't be discussing all this so the overview we have overuse injuries then lower extremity injuries upper extremity injuries back pain and potentially serious injuries so the overuse injuries these are the risk factors we have intrinsic risk factors and extrinsic risk factors so we can easily control the extrinsic risk factors taking care of the environment the equipment how we train the kids and the intrinsic risk factors are usually taken care of pre participation level which helps in kids in prevention of their injuries on a longer term now coming to overuse injuries now they can be apophysitis uh, we have you know the apophysis is the secondary ossification center so at the age of when this growth spurt they bound to have more of injuries related to different apophysis and we all know that the different eponyms which we have studied throughout our academic career then we have the bone stress injuries we can have it either high risk or low risk so the high risk are the ones which lead to loss of time from sports and might also threaten the future participation of the kid so depending upon different location we have high risk and uh, low risk we won't go into details because we have upcoming lectures on this particular topic now this is very important we have catastrophic injuries uh, we the most common cause of non traumatic death is cardiovascular which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and in cases of traumatic it is more because of head and neck injuries so the kid which you are saying in this slide you know he was 11 years old when he suffered cardiac arrest while playing football and he was playing for the club of arsenal under 13 so it's very important that uh, before playing you know everybody is screened for cardiovascular system so yeah, it, it is always told that you know if you work more it's better but it's not so the when the workload increases the level of fitness decreases so now there are some risk factors you know related to sports which uh, might cause overuse injuries so if you are specializing in particular sport at a very younger age you are more bound to have uh, injuries so this is a burning topic in the western world as of now whether to put our kids you know at a younger age in a particular sports or not and if you are playing for more than 5 to 6 days a week it leads to increased risk similarly if the work, if the playing hours are more that is a risk factor and also you know telling your kid to play through pain it's it's a very big risk factor we need to stop that so as uh, our role you know in all this uh, injuries is to identify high risk injuries to treat acute and chronic injuries appropriately and to like we are the main mediators between parents and the athlete and need to educate you know all the coaches the trainers therapists on how to prevent our injuries so prevention is the best modality in these sports injuries now if we come to key assessment uh we know we need to know the age of the kid is the kid is the kid having the growth spurt at that point of time or not whether the pain is chronic the duration and frequency of pain the severity of pain and the location of pain the it also need to ask the patient that uh, it has there been a recent change in the training volume or intensity because all of a sudden he can come up with pain there can be change in the performance they can be declining in performance and you know it's very important to ask female athletes if they are having any symptoms of amenorrhea we'll discuss upon that later on and coming to prevention you know it, as rightly said by benjamin franklin an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure so it's not only the uh, the child or the parent which has to do all the prevention activities we as a nation you know as a government everybody should be involved at different levels to help educate and prevent the sports injuries 
now if we know the developmental level of each kid no it's better uh, then it would be better for us to put a child into a particular play so we know that a kid of aged from 2 to 5 years of age he is not uh, fully developed he has limited fundamental skills fundamental balance skills are very less and the vision is not fully mature so it's best that they do running swimming throwing activities as they grow their fundamental skills improve their vision improves the learning attention span improves so we can you know make the kid play uh, entry level soccer or a baseball now as the kid grows into the age of 10 to 12 you know it's almost uh, the vision is almost like an adult the motor skills improve the learning is very much improved so they can play sports like basketball you know which it's a bit complex compared to other sports so uh, talking about prevention you know it's very important to have a pre participation examination in of the kid so in western world they have a whole format where they'll uh, screen the whole kid through from head to toe you know about every organ and system and we need to make sure that they have adequate rest we should avoid over scheduling the training we should monitor the training especially during the adolescent growth spurt and there are different uh, things we need to take care of the equipment the training ground the how the mode of training is done and most important is the return to play now if uh, the patient feels that is is okay that is not equally and is not equally heal is equally good now progression should be pain free range of motion functional drills endurance and agility testing should be done by the sports physician and sports specific skills should be done before the patient plays is natural sport now what can parents do you know they can ask their kids to play variety of sports when they are young you should wait till the age of 15 to 16 before they specialize in a sport you should allow kid to train less than their age per week you should think you know why your kid or you want him to specialize and keep an eye on your kid's health you know because that's very important especially the teen girls so this uh, was a strategy of uh, american college of sports medicine where they say that uh, i should avoid sports specialization limit the training to 18 to 20 hours per week limit practice for 1.5 hours and half hours or 4.5 hours per week depending upon your game focus more on intensity and uh, young athletes should take a week off every month now coming to the female athlete pride now this is very important uh we all know that we have all studied about female athlete pride which is menstrual disturbance low bone mineral density low energy availability so the kids who are playing they are more prone to female athlete prides it was usually uh, more common in gymnast in ballet dancers so but the term has now been replaced with the reds which is relative energy deficiency in sports so it is basically deficiency in the calorie which leads to loss of uh, muscle strength loss of carbohydrate storage you know which all leads to increased injury risk so it was found both in male and female athletes at a younger age so this term is now used instead of female athlete pride now this take home message is that it's a multidisciplinary approach so everybody you know right from the whole community needs to take part in this prevention of sports injuries in pediatric age group proper history taking is the key and we all know that prevention is better than cure thank you now coming to this picture you know this these three kids you know they were the youngest medal winners at olympics the girl who won this gold medal she was 13 years of age on her right she won silver she was 12 years of age both were from japan and the girl who won bronze she was from britain she also was 12 years of age so age is just a number so we need to decide upon uh, where is the limit to sports thank you thank you so much dr vikram that was excellent talk and well within the time limit of 15 minutes and uh, i request all the uh, attendees uh, to kindly post their uh, questions or queries in the chat box uh, we'll discuss them in uh, question and answer session and after this uh, we'll uh, move on to our next speaker for the day dr arun gupta sir he is head of the department of orthopedics at pushpanjari hospital agra he has done his uh, fellowship and uh, further uh, uh, work in uh, sports injury at the kmc manipal uh, i welcome dr arun sir and over to you sir uh, good evening everyone i am am i audible 
Hello. Yes. 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 yes sir. So, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, UPOA and uh, Department of Pediatric Orthopedics, KGMU. The topic given to me is stress fractures, avulsion, tendinopathies in teenagers. It's a huge topic. Probably, it requires a separate symposium for all these factors. I'll try to justify my talk. And uh, coming to stress fractures, uh, what is a stress fracture? These stress fractures occurs through otherwise normal bone that is subjected to repeated episodes of stress less severe than necessary to produce an acute fracture. It results from summation of stresses, any one of which by itself would have been harmless alone. The epidemiology has been taken uh, uh, in detail by uh, the previous speaker, Dr. Saini. It is common in athletes and teenagers preparing for military services. An increasing participation in sports in last decade has witnessed an increase in incidence in young children or athletes. Stress fracture at pediatric population are more liable to be mistaken and hence they are more important to decipher because they are mistaken at times as neoplasm or infection because of rapid periosteal response and abundant callus formation. The uh, uh, outline we will discuss about pathophysiology, risk factor association, diagnosis, general treatment and few specific cases. The cause is simply a change in load on the bone. So there could be small number of repetition with large load or large number of repetition with normal load. Or there could be an intermediate combination of increased load and repetition, which can lead to bone fatigue. So as we all know, as an orthopedic surgeon, that bone follows the Wolf's law. Change uh, in external stress leads to change in shape and strength of bone. And bone remodels in response to stress. So if there is abrupt increase in duration, intensity, or frequency without adequate rest, that is no chance of remodeling, it can lead to stress fracture. And that is imbalance between bone resorption and new bone formation, which will lead to microfracture. And if the load is continued, will lead to ultimately a stress fracture. So it is about 1% in general population and it about up to 8% in collegiate team sports. It is as high as about 31% in military recruits and the gold medalist among this is about 50% in runners. And we see that uh, with the advent of uh, so many um, highways or um, uh, expressways in all over the country, the rural uh, kids have got the space to run about and they develop uh, so many stress fractures in their lower limbs. So the risk, coming to the risk factors, so there could be a history of prior stress fracture, which can lead to further stress fracture, low level of physical fitness, that is a prior non-athlete, increasing volume and intensity of that particular exercise, female gender, as discussed with uh, Dr. Seni, menstrual irregularity, diet poor in calcium and protein, poor bone health and poor biomechanics, they all contribute to a development of risk uh, stress fractures. So the price prior, what is the prior stress fracture? There are about 6%, six times increased risk in distance runner and military recruits. 60% of athletes have history of prior, prior stress fractures. And there is a one year recurrence in about 12 to 13% of these kind of people. Poor physical fitness, because if somebody has got a less muscle mass, uh, that these muscle will absorb the physical impact. So more than one centimeter in calf girth can lead to uh, a tibial stress fracture. Less lean mass in lower extremity will lead to stress fractures. And less than seven months prior strength training is required. Suddenly the date is announced for a military recruitment, a police recruitment. The kids start running within a span of 15 days, they develop a stress fracture. So that is the risk factor. There are intrinsic factors such as uh, anatomical factors, extreme arch morphologies such as pass cavers or pass planus. The biomechanical factors also contribute to it. The shorter duration of foot pure pronation, subtalar joint poor control, 
tibial striking torque uh, when the when the kid doesn't know how to run properly early hind foot eversion these are all things which has to be taken care of while we are uh, looking into the uh, 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 etiology of stress fractures extrinsic factors like activity type and intensity footwear some people doesn't have the proper shoes the they should use the shock uh, shock absorbing cushion inserts and the running surface in urban area is the treadmill and in the rural area they are running on the concrete roads which can lead to a development of stress fractures associations especially with the uh, the type of sports like ballet dancing or bharatanatyam sort of dancing where hyperextension or the of the lumbar spine is required they can lead to lumbar spine femur metatarsal runners usually tibia metatarsal sprinters navicular bone long distance runners they have a propensity of femoral neck or pelvis fractures baseball tennis uh, humerus fracture gymnast spine foot pelvis golfers ribs hurdlers patella rowers in aerobics sacrum bowing and running will lead to pelvic stress fractures the classical uh, clinical history is that, is that there is a change in training or equipment gradual onset over 2 to 4 weeks initially pain only with activity and progresses to pain after activity eventually constant pain with activities of daily living is the presenting feature and the history is signif- uh, itself shows everything about that there is there is a history of sports partif- participation significant change in training that this suddenly they have gone to hills and they are running uphill the surface has changed the intensity has changed the dietary history about uh, inadequate vitamin d and calcium uh, loss uh, uh, loss of periods in young girls general health the occupation some medical history medication especially for some arthritis or self medication with steroids or the family history of osteoporosis all they can lead to osteoporosis the investigation the preliminary investigation is usually a plain x ray and remember only 30% positive on initial x ray examination 10 to 12 20% never show up on plain films if it is positive on x ray there will be a localized periosteal reaction or it could be a radiolucent line and in cancellous bone remember there could be a band like fo- focal sclerosis which is a telltale sign of a stress fracture so here is a case if you see in this particular x ray it can be passed as normal when the when the uh, young athlete came with a foot pain after running and uh, uh, after one week we can see that there is a frank fracture in the third metatarsal shaft uh, uh, which has become evident in the uh, third week of the uh, presentation so bone scan is the most sensitive investigation with 95 95% show up after one day extremely sensitive but remember not as specific with up to 24% false positive re- uh, results it can differentiate between acute and old lesions acute stress fracture is three phase positive and shin splint uh, type of injury can be delayed can be captured in delayed phase only mri versus bone scan the mri is less invasive readily available across all the towns where the bone scan is not easily available provided more information than bone scan and recommended for initial diagnosis and staging of stress injuries limited mri may be cheaper than bone scan at most of the institutions how you decide whether to ask for mri or bone scan mri usually can be done more quickly it, re- it usually takes 40 50 minutes uh, as compared to 4 hours in a bone scan and is scheduled for a sooner date there is no radiation hazard and has a better sh- soft tissue detail whereas bone scan covers a wider area of body if bilateral or diffuse symptoms are there sometimes easier to interpret because at times we are not Uh, the patient is not um, able to tell us the exact site of pain then the stress fracture then the bone scan is better and at times the bone scan is cheaper in some uh, government institute so the general treatment of the stress fracture is to protect reduce pain promote healing prevent further bone damage activities of daily living are permitted continue with stretching and flexibility exercises 
cross training that is non weight bearing exercises can be continued there has to be a modified rest for 6 to 8 weeks or until pain free for 2 to 3 weeks then only they are allowed to do their sporting activity or running activity the activity modification means that particular activity should be pain free and is away from that affected limb the approximate desired activity can be like cycling swimming leisure walking elliptical trainer deep water running and remember any one of these activity once we advocate must be pain free the rehabilitation exercise will address the biomechanical issue like muscle rigidity limb length discrepancy excessive pronation pes cavus pes planus replace the running shoe and the strength training by various modules the sites of stress fractures have been studied in detail and the commonest one is the tibia which we uh, see almost in our opds it's about 40% then metatarsal 21% fibula and pelvis about 2% so the high risk one the bones are depending on the type of sports like pars inter articularis of the spine femoral head neck patella anterior cortex of tibia that is the tension side and the smaller bones like talus tarsal navicular bone proximal fifth metatarsal sesamoid of great toe base of second metatarsal and at times medial malleolus so anterior and middle third stress fracture of the tibia are very concerning they are usually tension side of the bone and they are very painful may present like shin splints it becomes uh, uh, the anterior tibia is swollen hard and more commonly seen in jumpers and leapers you can see a dreaded black line on x ray and they heal very poorly and uh, take a lot of time to heal you can see a small crack in the anterior cortex of the tibia it's a dreaded black line the the treatment is to immobilize uh, uh, for at least 4 to 6 weeks and at times the 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 athlete or the runner or the sprinter they don't uh, take your advice and they culminate into a complete fracture and that point of time the intramedullary rod may be required to fix the fracture the fifth metatarsal stress fracture uh, is different from a avulsion fracture and a jones fracture so if you see that the stress fracture is more at metaphyseo diaphyseal junction and it is important because it has got a higher risk of delayed union or non union as compared to jones and avulsion fracture non weight bearing cast for 6 weeks is required and if you see there is slightest of displacement and disobedience from the patient patient side we should advocate a uh, intramedullary screw fixation in a uh, 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 patient the femoral stress fractures are primarily present in symptom is a groin pain possibly in thigh or knee at times difficult to identify and then bone scan is required or mri is required hip motion may be painful and hop test patient is not uh, able to hop is required fulcrum test for sh uh, shaft uh, femur fracture is at times positive the femoral neck stress fracture early diagnosis is very critical if x ray is negative bone scan or mri has to be ordered the mri diagnostic is a diagnostic imaging of choice for femoral neck stress fractures so there could be of two type like compression side that is on the medial aspect of that inferior part of the femoral neck they are rather in younger patients and less likely to become displaced because of the forces on that and complications are pos possible if neglected treatment is usually non weight bearing followed by toe touch weight bearing and then partial weight bearing over a period of 8 to 12 weeks usually they heal uneventfully and on the contrary the stress fractures on the distraction side that is on the superior side the tension side of the neck they have high propensity to become displaced and can lead to frequent complications they should be treated if you see a complete fracture line even on mri with a aggressive internal fixation in coming to tarsal bones they are in more in sprinters jumpers and the mean interval to diagnose is about 12 months before they could be diagnosed because of uh, the poor picturization in of the tarsal bone and there could be a vague midfoot pain pain in the dorsum of foot at times they present with simple cramps which are usually ignored 
And so there is usually an end spot for the navicular fracture, which is tender to palpation when a patient has a navicular stress fracture. When you see, you have to palpate it here. That is, this is the avascular uh, central one third of the uh, navicular. The bone scan can depict and pick it up at very early stage and MRI uh, or CT scan can catch it at the um, inception of the fracture. So, more studies suggest that allowance of weight bearing immediately after diagnosis can increase the non-union rate in this navicular bone fracture. The simple rule is the bone scan MRI or uh, at the early stage to diagnose the fracture and then non-weight bearing cast for six to eight weeks and then gradual rehab. If the fracture is complete, then open reduction internal fixation with compression screw with or without bone grafting may be required. The high-risk fracture sites, uh, as uh, we have discussed, that femoral neck, tension side, navicular, fifth metatarsal, anterior tibial shaft, and they are high-level athlete and laborer, and they can fail to, uh, fail to conservative therapy. The prevention uh, has to be advocated to all patients that some small incremental increases in training is required. Shock absorbing shoe and boot inserts, calcium and vitamin supplementation, significant increase in bone mineral density, no impact on stress fracture rate. Modification of female recruit training has to be uh, advocated that lower march speed to run on softer surface, individual, individual step length and speed, interval training instead of continuous training, which has been advocated by American Academy as well. So the take-home points are avoid a delay in diagnosis, do imaging diagnosis, diagnostic test early in the um, uh, symptom, symptomatic period. Remember, rest is only a four-letter word to these kids and athletes because they are very hyperactive. And as soon as some amount of pain is less, they will again go to play. So thus advise a relative rest, allowing for various kind of cross training to satisfy their energy on the unaffected body training part so that the affected part heals fast. Correct underlying nutritional, hormonal or biomechanical abnormalities to promote healing and prevent recurrence. Despite our best efforts, some athletes will never return to their pre-injury level of competition due to some specific stress fractures like navicular, femoral neck and anterior tibia. So counsel them properly. Coming to avulsions and tendinopathy, the second part of this talk, that the avulsion injuries or a fracture occur where the joint capsule, ligament, tendon, or muscle attachment site is pulled off from the bone, usually taking a fragment of cortical bone. Avulsion injuries results from application of tensile force to the musculoskeletal unit or a ligament. And avulsion Hello, fractures sir. are commonly... Hello? Uh, uh, sir, uh, the uh, the amount of time allotted is over. Uh, if this is too long, we can accommodate in some other uh, webinar also. Yeah. Can I sum it fast? Yeah, sure, sir. sure. So, avulsion fractures are commonly distracted due to high tensile forces involved. And remember, the most common site of avulsion injuries in the adolescent and children are apophysis of pelvis and knee. There are two distinct kinds of avulsion, acute and chronic. So acute occurs because of sudden forceful injury, whereas uh, uh, there is a clear, clear history in most of the cases. In contrast, chronic injuries are due to repeated submaximal forces. And these are the basic uh, vulnerable apophysial avulsion sites depicted in this long slides. So coming to the pelvic and femoral avulsion injuries, which are more common, they are based uh, divided into two groups. The most common injury mechanism is abrupt, strong, and concentric and eccentric concentric con contraction of large muscle that occurs during an attempt to accelerate or decelerate the body mass, such as the split, uh, or uh, you see the cheerleaders which are splitting in the various games. They are usually the young girls in their late teens. The apophysial avulsion injuries of the hip and pelvis usually occur in the adolescent athletes and can go till their mid-20s. Remember, the apophysial physis usually fuses later than the physis of 
long bone. In the largest study by Rossi and Dragoni, they have found that the maximum number of apophyseal avulsions are near the ischial tuberosity. Uh, the ischial tuberosity is the insertion side of uh, very strong adductor muscles. And you see here in a case of about 16-year-old taekwondo player, a flake of bone has been avulsed in a flying kick, which is rather more easily picked up on an MRI. The ultrasound, CT, and MRI are more useful than plain X-ray to find out these avulsion injuries. And MRI is the most accurate imaging tool for a diagnosis, especially for identifying these kind of injuries. The treatment for avulsion injuries, if they are less than 1.5 millimeter apart, they respond to conservative treatment. At times, if they are displaced more than 2 centimeters, they need to be fixed. The another common site is anterior superior iliac spine and anterior inferior iliac spine, which are again in a sudden burst of energy, like in a gymnast, you see in this CT scan and X-ray. And again, the same principle of two centimeter is used to uh, treat these kind of injuries. The knee is the third most common site for these sort of avulsion injuries. And we know a very common thing that is Seagorn fracture, usually associated with the lateral side of uh, tibia, in which the capsular injury is also there, often associated with ACL injury as well. The ACL avulsion of tibial eminence is quite common. And this has, this, this has been taken in detail by the next speaker. Summary, although diverse the avulsion injuries occur in all age groups, they primarily affect skeletally immature athlete. These injuries can mimic more serious conditions such as infection or neoplasm because of the variety of imaging findings associated at different stages of mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was excellent talk on a, such a vast topic and uh, we are uh, thankful that uh, you have covered all of uh, these issues in a short lecture. And uh, uh, we are again announcing that uh, the... Uh, Current uh, webinar is uh, live on Zoom as well as YouTube and Ortho TV. And currently, more than 50 delegates are attending this uh, thing. And uh, we welcome all the delegates who have joined later and they can post their questions on the chat box and we'll take up the question in the question and answer session. And now I request uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman, sir, the next speak speaker who is consultant in the AMRI Hospital, Kolkata, and he's well-known speaker uh, all around India. And uh, uh, he'll be presenting the final talk for today. Over to you, Dr. Rajiv, sir. Thank you, Suresh. And thanks to UPO and KGMU for invitation. So I will be talking now the ACL injuries in pediatric knee, a very common uh, injury now we see on our day-to-day -day practice because of increasing at a number of sports person who are participating in sports. And why this topic is important? Because I think this quotation I have to with my pediatric orthopedic friends only. Children are not a small adult. So you should have a different plan and you also have a different planning for them. Because it's not like that. The way we treat the ACL injuries in adult, we should treat them uh, this in the same way in children. And what is difference in pediatric and adolescent ACL injury? If you see the incidence, the numbers are not quite less. It's almost 0.5 to 3% of all ACL injury. And the most common age group is between 8 to 12 years or sometimes 13 years of age. And there is still a debate whether what should be the operative timing, what are the repair techniques, whether you should go for a conservative treatment or an operative treatment. So treatment options, yes, we have different treatment options. Conservative, it has been the treatment of choice for decades and we have been treating most of the ACL injuries conservatively even in our residency days. And nowadays, if you ask me what are the ideal cases for conservative treatment is the partial ACL tear because in children and adults, the chances of healing of ACL is more. So most of this partial ACL tear, if the patient is asymptomatic, yes, go for conservative treatment. Yes, operative treatment. Now, in athletic population and a sports person, I think it's the treatment of choice. And all children with the symptomatic knee, 
suppose the patient is having a history of giving way the patient is ha having the history of instability in those patient those symptomatic patient try to treat them, treat them operatively so timing a billion dollar question when you operate either it's early or delayed and there's a difference of opinion not only in orthopedic surgeon but in sports surgeon also whether we should wait or we should treat them immediately immediately it's not been day one whether we should treat them within 5 or 6 weeks of injury before the closer of 5 weeks so early is you plan your treatment immediately within 4 to 6 weeks and delayed is you wait till the closer of the crisis what is the advantage of early treatment we can prevent this secondary damage to the menisci and other ligament and cartilage if we treat this symptomatic patient early and what is the advantage of delayed treatment you can treat them like an adult patient suppose your patient has having a acl injury at 13 year of age and he is ready to go with lifestyle modification for one or uh, boy and in those patient if you wait for them for uh, two or three years so that when the physis will fuse you will plan for your uh, acl reconstruction and it will be too late for him because of his training program and if he is a sports person i think that will be a career ending sports injury for him regarding technique they have been different technique described in literature you you see, go through the campbell you have the physial sparing technique that is the intraarticular technique the transfacial physial or over the top technique the partial transfacial technique and now i think if you ask me what is the gold standard i think it's the physial sparing technique where you can do the intraarticular acl reconstruction avoiding injury to the physis and that is i think the standard treatment protocol we follow in our day to the practice extraarticular uh, process i think now it's out of date no one of none of the sports surgeon or none of the pediatric surgeons are doing it now it is because it's non on anatomical so most of us are now doing a physial space a is sparing acl reconstruction in those patients so why it is gold standard because it's anatomical and it will give a native acl almost near normal acl to that pediatric or adolescent knee so this is a small video technique of physial sparing sparing acl reconstruction you can see here this is a gymnastic player he was, he was a gymnastic from bangladesh you can see he is having a typical anteromedial instability the pivot is positive the latchman is positive so normally you we take a semi graft in this patient in pediatric acute patients you harvest it from the uh, medial aspect of the proximal tibia and try to remove the adhesions and normally because these knees are very small knees so you can have a quadruple graft of 7 7.5 or 8 mm is good enough for those pediatric knee so once you have harvested the graft you can see and uh, i keep the needle there because i want to suture it with the periosteum at the end of the procedure And once you put your scope inside, you can see there's a thin ACL, a bundle of a rim of ACL is there because this patient was symptomatic. So try to clear the remnant first because that is the anatomical point where you want to insert your ACL. And here, always take use of CR under image intensifier. What I do using my PCL jig, I make I pass my bead pin from outside in technique. You can see. and you can see in the cm that yes it's not crossing the physis where this is sparing the physis so once you have done it you can see here so with this pcl jig you are i am trying to make my fibular tunnel from outside in technique so at every step and now pass your suture loop through the femoral tunnel it's almost same as that is the suction the only good thing is that you have to take help of cm so that you are not damaging the physis in the same way you take you point over the tibial artery also and put it over the anatomical point and now you pass your loop from the femur to the tibia you can see and once you have passed it what is important fixation at the femoral side normally what happens because the tunnel is very small you can't put a endo button loop here so almost normally we use a metal or a wire screw over that because it's a physial spring you can put that a screw over the uh, femoral tunnel and once you have fixed it the second part is fixation over the tibial side normally don't use a screw on the tibial side or try to use a post at least 5 to 6 cm below the tibial joint line so that you are not damaging the tibial physis and you can see here once you have fixed it now the most important part is the, i have kept that needle there you can see that that needle part is there so we try to 
give some amount of two or three whip stitches through the periosteum with the remaining part of ACL. You can see a robust ACL reconstruction has been done and the latchman uh, at the end of it, there is no anterior translation of the tibia. So yesterday only I asked him to say the video. Now he is 14 years, three years follow up. You can see this player and he is practicing in Bang Bandhu Stadium, Bangladesh. So what is important? In pediatric age group, whenever you see this scaldally immature patient, normally you get a total ACL tear or a partial ACL tear or an incomplete ACL tear. So most of the time, if you are dealing with a patient in pediatric age group or adult soldiers with a partial ACL tear, it's the important goal is rehabilitation. And the golden rule of rehabilitation is try to keep them on regular follow-up, try to extend the hamstring more than the quadriceps. Why it is important? Because Hamstring is agonist of ACL. It's the agonist muscle of ACL. So, what the standard practice of an orthopedic surgeon is most of the time with every ACL injury, we ask them to do a quadriceps. Quadriceps is agonist of PCL. So, don't try to put this patient on quadriceps uh, strengthening. Try to put this patient on hamstring uh, strengthening because we want to strengthen the agonist muscle. And that is important part. Suppose you have exercise program of 10 minutes. So 6 minutes should be for hamstring and 4 minutes should be for quadriceps. It should be always more than your quadriceps standing or quadriceps rehab program. So most of this incomplete tear, try to treat them conservatively. If you are dealing with a complete tear, some of the patient may have a complete ACL tear. So again, you divide it with three age group. Then at stage 1 or 2, that is male less than 12 or female less than 11 years. Always, always go for a 5GL sparing ACL reconstruction. Believe me, that is the gold standard where you do damage the physis and you are creating an anatomic ACL which will be a long-lasting anatomical ACL reconstruction. Second group of patient is then in stage 3 or 4 where your male patient less than 13 years and female patient less than 12 to 14 years. Again, here you can plan for a trans physial ACL reconstruction. But always, always, always use a soft tissue graft. One graft is contraindicated in pediatric age group and adult age group is your bone patellar tendon graft. Never time to put the bone patellar tendon graft in adult age group because of foundation of the physial scar. And that may lead to a deformity in the proximal tibia or a distal femur. And the third group of patient is standard 5. You are male more than 16 years and female more than 14 years of age group. And you don't have to bother in such type of patient. You can plan your standard ACL reconstruction like you do it in adult. That is a normal tibial tunnel, normal tibial tunnel over the anatomical location. So that is the standard practice we follow in our day-to-day -day practice. Partial tear, try to treat them, rehab them conservatively. The hamstring rehabilitation should be more than the quadriceps. Complete tear according to his group plan, either physial sparing, trans physial, or ACL reconstruction as like adult in adolescent group, where a male patient more than 60 years, female patient is more than 14 years. This is the standard treatment protocol protocol for the ACL injury. And avulsion injury, actually, I, uh, I didn't prepare for avulsion injury because I thought uh, Dr. Arun will be speaking on that. If you want, I can show you a video of avulsion injury. But I think if you want, we can go for discussion with ACL injuries only. Thank you so much, sir. And I think uh, the uh, we'll go, go ahead with question and answer session, uh, Ajay, sir. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, comprehensive talk. And I've received a few questions on my uh, WhatsApp uh, regarding the uh, talks of today. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Abhishek uh, to answer a few. So uh, you talked about uh, uh, the pre-participation checkup. So what is the end, uh, scenario of this checkup in India and how, what do you recommend that should be doable and uh, see, should, uh, see, the thing is, you know, actually, uh, as of now, we don't have any specific protocol which we follow in India. So, so, so we uh, there's a uh, specific uh, prescribed format, you know, which is there in uh, the Western world. Even in uh, Asian countries like China and Japan, this uh, form, like, wherever, you know, a kid is there in a school or wherever he is participating in the sports, so they have to go through everything. Like, they'll get their uh, every uh, system checked up cardiovascular abdominal they'll uh, go through if they have any um, any any other uh, 
differences in the anti version you know the whole mechanics the mind and mental get everything checked so i think as of now of in indian scenario i think uh, it's uh, it's high time that we you know as a uh, big nation you know we should uh, come up with something you know a format which i think should be applied right from the school level you know before the kid goes into playing at a high level yeah, sure sure we are looking uh, to you to make some guidelines for us yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, one more question: What should be the stretching or cool down routine uh, which which we should recommend? Uh, we should Now, it, it, the thing is, you know, it it, it depends follow. upon you know which sport the person is playing, which sports. Uh, so, ideally, you know, whenever we are playing a sport, uh, the uh, thing is, you know, stretching uh, forms a very integral part. So, before uh, they go into their session of training, they have to uh, do lot of. They have to do almost if there's a hour of uh, session you know almost half an hour of stretching has to be done before and half an hour of stretching should be done after their session sure thank you so much and i would like to go ahead uh, to dr raman sir uh, sir you have told uh, uh, fajal sparing techniques for acl uh, reconstruction so as as pediatric orthopedicians first thing comes up with physis is the effect of tunneling on the physis and is it possible that we do a uh, acl reconstruction on one side and do a go growth modulation on the other side just a personal no, question i think yeah see see that is for deformity the standard practice uh, people uh, do it for deformity but usually for epidetic acl because most of these uh, children or adolescents are of uh, they are very active age group so i think the best way is that you That's should not good. damage the physis either of the same or the contralateral side so it's say physical sparing surgery is the gold standard nowadays we practice either you go for a physical or ask the patient to have limitation in activity and plan for your acl reconstruction after 15 or 16 years there you can go for a normal uh, acl reconstruction like you do it in adult sure 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 sir thank you so much sir and one more question sir uh, when a child comes with a history of injury to knee and uh, i i don't think many of uh, us uh, will be able to do a, a physical sparing so we need to refer it to a regular uh, uh, maybe more yes. expert See, scopy surgeon what happens yeah physical so what should be the timing of uh, referring the child i mean acutely child has come with a knee injury so this treatment treatment protocol is like same it's like rice treatment with a rest immobilization cold compression you can do and uh, compression that is important so keep the knee in rest if there is a huge hematoma you can aspirate also and you can ideally the best time to repair them uh, go for the construction is 3 to 4 week when your knee is silent except for avulsion injuries whenever you are getting with a acl or a pcl avulsion injuries in those cases usually we try to, to fix them within 7 or 10 days but for acute rupture of acl i think third to fourth week is the ideal time where when you can plan for the construction in the pediatric age okay thank you so doctor you should say something you know to surely this common misconception misconception amongst the orthopedic surgeon is that uh, in pediatric injuries they all will heal and at times the patient is also asymptomatic because he is not able to explain you the symptoms of the acl injury itself so if it's an isolated acl injury it's like a prophylactic injury for that particular knee because sudden feeling of give way can lead to tears of meniscus and that is like a suicide for that particular knee so the the orthopedic surgeon whether he is a general orthopedic surgeon or a pediatric orthopedic surgeon has to forewarn the parents that if he wants to pursue a sporting career or something like that he need to see a knee specialist or arthroscopy specialist at the earliest yeah 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 sure sir sure. thank you so much sir and uh, uh, next question Arun, to uh, Arun, is it, yeah. can i ask are yeah. is it that if only he is pursuing a uh, 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 this athletic career then only he should do i think it should be operated because the, sir, in young yes, age you have how yes. long they can continue without damaging their meniscus they will lead to uh, arthritis i think so what's the experience you people have with that as so we can delay the surgery when the patient reaches its uh, is about to reach his skeletal maturity so we can do a normal acl reconstruction in that particular patient and uh, if the patient is on the sporting side we have to go for a physical sparing technique that is why we can delay for it so acl 
there there are very less examples of isolated acl injury performing at a very high a normal sort of rate in sporting or otherwise normal life but we have to tell them that this is like a prophylactic injury many isolated acl injured patients children or adults they are at times asymptomatic but on clinical examination the latchman is positive the pivot shift is positive probably they have not tested their knee in pivoting sort of uh, sport or daily activities of living so uh, if the child is young as uh, dr rajiv raman has given a flow chart we can ask them he is not into very active sports till he is about 15 16 nearing his skeletal maturity then he can undergo a proper acl reconstruction if he is in active sports at that particular time and wants to pursue his career in sports then uh, physical sparing technique is the answer to it i think uh, javan sir it was a very good question uh, whenever you are dealing with a children who is asymptomatic but your latchman is positive you think pivot is also positive all your clinical signs are positive the patient is not telling any symptoms of instability neither is complaining of any giving pain in the knee i think those are the ideal patient non sports person children where you can wait till the phase is closer you can plan for your normal acl reconstruction i think physical sparing is for symptomatic patients and at adult you divide it as patient who are sedentary and active in children you can't divide that this child child will be sedentary or something eight years child he will be active child so if he is symptomatic i think you have to plan something for him either you if you were not doing a physical sparing which is a very technical demanding surgery because you have to make your tunnel under cm guide normal acl reconstruction took 30 minutes but believe me dr arun is here if you are doing a physical sparing acl it takes around 1 hour to 1 and a half hour because you are making you are passing your bit pin under cm guide every time you have to see under cm whether you are back, uh, you are avoiding of physics or not So it's a very technically demanding surgery. So if you can't do a physical sparing surgery, I think you can plan for extra articular procedure also, which has been the treatment of choice in those children for decades. But the important thing is to counsel the parents. The most important thing that this particular child will definitely need a surgery if he wants to pursue an active sporting yes. career. Yes. thank you so much sir uh, one uh, more question is for there, dr arun is there any way to assess the partial acl tear most of the time you get an mri this tear a partial tear but it is actually a full tear what is there any some clinical uh, signs which you people are following or you are just relying on the mri clinically it's very difficult to differentiate between a partial and complete tear one good sign is that If your patient is symptomatic and you are getting an end point which is hard, anterior translation with a hard end point, it is suggestive of a partial tear. Anterior end translation with a soft end point is uh, suggestive of your complete acl tear. So I think that is the only finding where a symptomatic patient you are having a hard end point, but it is anterior translation compared to the normal side. You can tell clinically yes, this patient may have a partial acl. Again, for partial and complete ACL, I think a bundle uh, reading of the bundles of partial tear and complete tear, you should have a very good musculoskeletal radiologist. So ask your radiologist friend to take an MRI, 15 degree oblique sagittal cut, which is very important. That is the cut which will show you both of the bundles. Or if there is a partial tear, you can tell yes, this patient is having partial tear. Because normal sagittal cut in most of these MRI finding, you will see the radiologist is reporting a partial ACL tear because you can't see whole of the ACL profile in normal sagittal cut. It should be 15 degree oblique sagittal cut. The most common mistake done by most of the radiologists is they seldom take or they are not in control of the radiology technician. They seldom take a coronal oblique as mentioned by Dr. Rajiv Raman. so good coronal oblique sections can easily identify a partial or complete tear so if there is doubt we can ask the patient to undergo a mri again at a good radiology center okay and they they can take a coronal oblique cuts and that will clear our doubts based on more thing i would like to say uh, like in clinic i know if we if we see uh, the pivot shift it is uh, grade 2 3 you know and the and the uh, anterior draw like uh, is 
plus one. So I think uh, that goes more in the favor of surgery because uh, if the more of the pivoting activity, you know, which we need. So if the patient is pivot shift is grade two, three, I think uh, that is more in the favor of surgery. Yeah. Those are symptomatic patients. Symptomatic so like because that is what like if, if we have a partial tear, you know, and uh, we have a pivot shift two, three, and anterior draw is or Lachman is uh, grade one. So I think that goes more in the favor of uh, surgery than conservative. So, if pivot shift is positive in your hand, yes. that itself is a yes. prime indication yes. for surgery. Yes. So, many times we have a pivot shift and uh, we don't have anterior draw. So, in that case, I think uh, it's better to go for surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, one last question to Dr. Arun, sir. Dr. Shinde has asked a question, maybe from uh, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah. 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 You have to, yes, sir. Uh, the minimum. So yes, I think min yeah, minimum yeah. amount of soft tissue graft in tanner one and two cases we accept. And normally, what happens in physial splitting? It's a minimum fifty millimeter graft should be inside the tunnel. That is standard practice we follow in arthroscopic practice. So you your fifteen millimeter graft is inside because your graft heals at aperture. It's not the tunnel healing which is important, but at least fifteen millimeter graft should be there in uh, femoral tunnel. Thickness also, thickness. Like 7 millimeters is okay for children. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir. One last question to Dr. Arun, sir. Sir, apart from uh, the, uh, the usual rice uh, as first aid for stress fracture, what kind of splintage or uh, slab or plaster is uh, recommended and for how long? Because it will be difficult to uh, give uh, a, a running child uh, too much of uh, plastering or immobilization. Yes, so uh, depending on the personality of the child, I usually ask the parents that uh, compliant hai, how compliant the child is, agyakari hai ki nahi. So suppose uh, the child is compliant and uh, hails from a rural background, they are more compliant patient uh, uh, to their parents. Then at, at times a simple splintage like a crepe bandage and few warning tips and limitation of activity will work for around four weeks because the, 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 the kid bone will heal very fast. And if the child is not compliant, you can notice in your clinic that it is still with the injury roaming around, touching your object, touching your hammer, your stethoscope, and other things. That makes the sense that he is a bit naughty kid. And then I go for a, a immobilization like a, a fiber cast slab or something for four to six weeks, depending on the nature of fracture. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, with this, I think uh, we should uh, conclude the question, question and answer the session. Thickness of graft, I think it should be 6.5 to 7.5. That is standard thickness of graft. Dr. Gopal Sinde has asked. So 6.5 to 7.5 is the standard thickness the uh, preferred in pediatric case group. Yes, sir. Yeah. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, with this, uh, we conclude the question and answer session. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Vikas Verma. He is Associate Professor in uh, Department of uh, Pediatric Orthopedics, KGMU, to present closing uh, remarks for today's session and vote of thanks to uh, the team for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Vikas, sir, please. Thanks, Suresh. It was a very well-organized webinar. All the presentations were very precise, crisp, and academically excellent. Dr. Abhishek Sani spoke, spoke on the epidemiology and approach to pediatric sports injuries. He underlined the importance of exercise in children, and the benefits of physical activity in youth. He stressed on the differences between pediatric and adult sports injury epidemiology. Another important point he stressed was that these injuries are preventable and a multidisciplinary approach is needed to manage these injuries. Dr. Arun spoke on the topic stress fractures, aversions, tendinopathies, and strains in teenagers. An important point he made out was that these injuries may be missed out in the x-rays initially. And later on, they are more liable, liable to be confused with neoplasts. So this is a very confusing thing that all of us should be aware of. Then he described the pathophysiology, epidemiology, risk factors, salient points in history to make a diagnosis of such injuries. The approach to investigate these injuries treatment, the activity modification, rehabilitation required for these injuries. Dr. Rajiv Raman spoke on the topic of ACL injuries in pediatric knees. 
He outlined, outlined the differences between ACL injuries in children and adolescents versus adults, the treatment options available, the approach to decide on operative priming, whether early or delayed. Then he described the importance of choosing the physial sparing technique and the importance of rehabilitation and choosing the right muscles to strengthen. I take this opportunity to express our heartfelt thanks to the Honorable Vice Chancellor General Bipin Puri for allowing us to hold this academic event. I thank Professor Ajay Singh Sir, HOD of Pediatric Orthopedics, who has guided us in this venture. I thank Dr. Fazal and Dr. Suresh, whose efforts made this webinar possible. I express thanks to UPOA, our collaborators, for this academic event. A special thanks to Dr. Sanjay Dhawan and Dr. Anu Pagarwal for encouraging us with their presence. I thank all the speakers who found time from their busy schedules to participate in this event. I thank Dr. Nirad Bijli and Dr. Ashok Shyam of Ortho TV, Mr. Sudhirtho of JNJ, and Mr. Farhan of IT Cell of KGMU, without whom this event would not have been possible. In the last but not the least, I express my thanks to the delegates who attended the webinar for it is their participation which encourages us to hold such academic events. Thank you. Uh, Suresh, ask everybody uh, to switch on the video so that uh, we can take a uh, group. Faisal, uh, you take a group photograph of everyone. Right, sir. Requesting everyone to please uh, switch on the front camera so that we can take a webinar selfie. Inmeda, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. It, it was very, very nice uh, webinar. Very nice, very informative. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.